Hello guys, and welcome to our 22nd example video following our course on proof writing. Now, today's example video is going to be on cardinality. And for all of today's examples, we are going to be considering two different sets and then describing a bijection between the two of them to demonstrate that they have the same cardinality. So for this first example, we have R, which is all real numbers, and the open interval 0, 1, and we want to show that they have equal cardinality. So I'm actually going to give you the function that I came up with. If you're wondering how to come up with functions like this, a lot of times you just need to do, do it through exploration. It can sometimes be difficult to come up with a function that is a bijection depending on the two sets that you are talking about. So sometimes you need to do it through exploration, although at other times you can just use your imagination and come up with something that accurately describes a bijection between both sets. If you're stuck, I would encourage you to use the many resources out there in your exploration. But anyway, getting into this example, our function, which I will write as g, which will go from r to the open interval 0, 1, I will define in the following way. Uh, g of x is equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the x. And so if you want now, you can take some time to mess around with this function and plug a bunch of real numbers in for x here and see that all of the values you will get on the open interval 0 to 1. But I'm going to go ahead and perceive with the bijective proof. And of course, a bijection is a function that is both injective and surjective. So we're going to begin this proof by proving injectivity. So I'll write that out now. So if you recall, an injective proof is we're going to suppose that we have, let's say, g of x and g of y, which are equal to each other. And we want to show that this fact, g of x equals g of y, implies that x equals y. So let's go ahead and break this down with a simple definition of our function here. We'll have 1 over 1 plus e to the x is equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the y. And we can flip both sides of this to get the fact that 1 plus e to the x is equal to 1 plus e to the y. We can cancel these ones out and then undo our exponential here with a logarithm and we will get the fact that x is equal to y. So that proves that this function is injective. So now we want to prove surjectivity. And as a reminder for surjectivity, we want to show that for every b in our codomain, there is an a in our domain that we can plug into our function to map to that b. In other words, our function can map to all elements in our codomain. So generally speaking, we start with, uh, with a surjective proof. We will start with some scratch work. We will you know, suppose f of a is equal to b, and then we will solve for a, and we will use that value for a in our proof. So let's go ahead and start with some scratch work for our surjective proof here. So we're going to go ahead and begin by supposing that b is on the imp open interval 0 to 1, because that is our codomain. And we want to look at g of a is equal to b. So we'll break that down using the definition of our function. That means 1 over 1 plus e to the a is equal to b. And like I said, we want to solve for a here. So we'll begin by rewriting this as 1 plus e to the a is equal to 1 over b. Then we can subtract that 1 over, and we'll get that e to the a is equal to 1 over b minus 1. And then we can take the natural log to get that a is equal to the natural log of 1 over b minus 1. So I'll just go ahead and write that here real quick. We have that a is equal to the natural log of the entire thing 1 minus b minus 1. And you might be able to simplify that, but I'm not going to because it will probably make it easier when we do our calculation for our proof. So let's go ahead and do our proof for surjectivity here. So to begin our proof by for surjectivity, we're going to once again suppose that b is on the open interval 0 to 1. And then we're going to define the value of a that we calculated here in our scratch work. And we're going to let a equal the natural log of 1 over b minus 1. And then we are going to consider g of a and show that that is equal to b. So we're going to consider g of a, well, by definition of our function, that will be 1 over 1 plus e to the power of our a there. So e to the power of the natural log of 1 over b minus 1. Well, the, that natural log and e will undo each other, and we will get that this is 1 over 1 plus 1 over b minus 1. Well, we can see those ones will cancel, and 1 over 1 over b is just equal to b. So you can see we started with g of a and show that that is equal to b. So we can always choose an a such that when we plug that a into our function g, we will get b. So now that we've proved that this function is a bijection, let's go ahead and get into our next cardinality problem. 
So this one says, show that the, int the set of all integers z and the set of all real numbers x, such that the sine of x equals one has equal cardinality. And so to begin this problem, we kind of want to look at what x is can we plug into the sine function to get one? Well, we know that the sine of pi over two is equal to one, and we also know that the sine function is two pi periodic. So that means we will have pi over two plus two pi multiples. So we can write that in the following way. The sine of x is equal to one for all x which are in the set pi over two plus two pi n, such that n is an integer. So if we add a two pi multiple to that, we will just go back around the unit circle two pi over two and end up with the same sine value there. Great, so now we can define our function in the following way. So we are going to define our bijection, which we'll represent by f, which goes from the integers to this set, uh, which is defined in our problem for us here, of all real numbers x, such that the sine of x is equal to one. In the following way, we'll have that f of x is equal to two pi times x plus pi over two. Great. And so let's go ahead and get into proving that this is both injective and surjective. So let's start with injectivity, which will be fairly simple. So for injectivity, we're going to suppose that f of x is equal to f of y. Well, that means that two pi x plus pi over two is equal to two pi y plus pi over two. But we can very easily see that that will directly imply that x is equal to y. Great. So now we can get into our surjective proof. So to start our surjective proof, we are going to want to do some scratch work here. So we're gonna to wanna to look at f of a is equal to b and then solve for a. But f of a is equal to b means that two pi times a plus pi over two is equal to b. We can subtract that pi over two to the other side and then divide by pi and we will get that a is equal to b minus pi over two all over two pi. Great, so we're gonna use that value of a when we do our surjectivity proof. So let's go ahead and suppose that b is an element uh, from our codomain for this surjectivity proof. So let's suppose that b is in the set all real numbers x such that the sine of x is equal to one. And then we are going to set our a equal to what we derived in our scratch work. So we're gonna set a equal to b minus pi over two, all over two pi. And then now we want to lastly consider f of a. Well, f of a is going to equal the following. We will have two pi times our value for a there, which will be b minus pi over two, all over two pi and then we will have plus pi over two. And we can see that those two pi's will cancel and that this negative pi over two will cancel with this pi over two once our denominators are cleared and we will just be left with b. So we got that f of a is equal to b, which means that for all b in our codomain, we can pick some element a from our domain such that the function f will map a to b. Great, so let's go ahead and get into our third example. For, so for this one, we wanna show that the integers and the set zero, one cross the natural numbers have equal cardinality. And we're going to do that just as we have been doing by creating a bijection between the two of them. So let's go ahead and define this function in the following way. So we're gonna define our function. Let's just go ahead and call it f again. We'll have f go, well, let's see. Let's have it go from our zero, one, cross the naturals to the integers. You could create a function that goes the other way and it would work just fine, but this is the one that I came up with. So we'll define our function in the following way. Let's call it f of, let's call it i comma n is equal to the following, where we have i plus negative one to the i times n. The reason I'm using i and n there is because i is kind of an indexing where it is either a zero or a one, whereas n is just a natural number there. So now that we have our function, let's go ahead and set out to try and prove that it is both injective and surjective. So let's look at injectivity first. So let's begin like we always begin our injectivity proof. So let's begin by supposing that we have f of i n is equal to f of j comma m. Great. 
Well, the way we're going to go about showing that these two ordered pairs are, are equivalent is by considering two cases, and the two cases we will consider are when i is equal to 0 and i is equal to 1, which we have the luxury of being able to do because i is in this case binary. So let's go ahead and look at the first case, and that case will be when i is equal to 0. Well, if i is equal to 0, then when we plug in our i and n into our function, we will just be left with n. So if i is equal to 0, we will have the following. We will have that n is equal to j plus negative 1 to the j times m. Great. But from here, we have two different possibilities. So if j is equal to 0 and if j is equal to 1. But if, a, if j is equal to 0, then we will just have n equals m. But m is a natural number, so that will mean that n is greater than 0. But if j is equal to 1, then n will be less than or equal to 0. And that's because we will pick up a negative for our coefficient for our m term there. And then we could subtract that uh, 1 over to our n side, and we would get that n minus 1 is equal to negative m. But we know that n is a natural number. And for the purposes of this course, we will not consider 0 to be a natural number. So if n is a natural number and it can't be equal to 0, n must be greater than 0, which means we must be working with this case here. So if n is greater than 0, that means j is equal to 0, but we already know that i is equal to 0, so we can draw the following conclusions. That means that i is equal to j, which is equal to 0. And also, when we plug in 0 to this part of our equation here, we will get that n is equal to m. But that's exactly what we wanted to prove to show that the ordered pair i n is equal to the ordered pair j m. Great. So now let's go ahead and do our second case. And our second case is going to be when i is equal to 1. Well, if i is equal to 1, then we can write our function in the following way. We will have 1 minus n is equal to j plus negative 1 to the j times m. And just like before, we can split this up into two cases where if j is equal to 0 and if j is equal to 1. Well, let's start by looking at this first case here. But if j is equal to 0, then we will get that 1 minus n is equal to m. Or written differently, that n minus 1 is equal to negative m. But we know that m is a natural number, and that means that negative m can be at least negative 1. But it is impossible for n minus 1 to be equal to negative 1, because, like I said, we're not considering 0 to be a natural number. So the lowest that n minus 1 can be is 0, which means that it is impossible for j to be equal to 0 when i is equal to 1 in this case. So I'll go ahead and write that this is impossible. And we know that it's impossible, like I said, from the fact that we know that n and m are natural numbers. So next we can look at if j is equal to 1. Well, if we plug in a 1 there, we will see that we get 1 minus m is equal to 1 minus n. But from then we can obviously infer that that implies that n is equal to m. And if j is equal to 1, then that also means that i is equal to j. So that means that since this is the only possible case that j is equal to 1, that we can infer that in the case where i is equal to 1, that i comma n is equal to j comma m. Great. So that proves that this function is in fact injective. So let's go ahead and look at surjectivity next. So for this surjective proof, I'm not actually going to do any scratch work here. I'm just going to look at the different possible cases for b. So we're going to begin by supposing that b is in the integers, and then I'm going to break down all possibilities for b to show that we can easily map to them using our function and values of a from our domain. So let's go ahead and start with the first case, which is if b is equal to 0. And so for that, we will evaluate our function at 1 and 1 minus b. Well, we can see that if we evaluate our function at that, we will have 1 plus negative 1 to the first power times 1 minus b. Well, if we multiply that negative 1 into our parentheses here, we will see that these 1s will cancel out, and this, this negative 1 will cancel out the negativity of our b here, and we will just get b, which in this case is equal to 0. Next, let's look at the case when b is strictly less than 0. And because we are dealing with an integer here, that would just be all negative numbers. And so when we are dealing with the negative num numbers here, we can use the following definition for our function. So we can take care of all of our negative numbers with f of 1 and b plus 1. And we can see that's true because we will need a 1 
for the exponent of our negative one term in order to pick up a negative number from our function. And then we have b plus one to cancel out that leading one to get what we need. So let's go ahead and look at our last case, which is of course, if b is greater than zero. So if b is greater than zero or b is a positive number, then we are going to need our first part of our ordered pair to be zero so we can get rid of that negative one there. And then of course we can just plug in b in that case because we will have gotten rid of our negative one and our leading one there and all we'll be left with is just b. So if we want our function to map to a positive integer, then all we have to do is plug in zero and that integer that we want to map to. Great, so that proves that no matter the integer, we can map to it using our function and elements from our domain. Great, so let's go ahead and get into our fourth and final example. Great, so for this last one, we have we want to show that n cross n and the set of all ordered pairs m and n, which are also elements of n cross n, but with the condition that m is less than or equal to n, have the same cardinality. And just as we have been doing, we want to define a bijection between them. And we will once again call this bijection f, and we will be going in the direction of n cross n, into our set there, which is defined as m n, which are also in n cross n, such that m is less than or equal to n. And we will define our function in the following way. We will have our function maps an ordered pair a and b in the following way, where it maps a to itself and it maps b to a plus b minus one. Great, so let's go ahead and start by proving that this function is injective. And we're going to do that by supposing that we have two ordered pairs that when plugged into our function are equally to, equal to each other. So let's say that f of a b is equal to f of c d. Well, by the definition of our function, we know that that immediately means that a is equal to c, but it also means that a plus b minus one is equal to c plus d minus one. Well, we can see that these minus ones will cancel and we know that a is equal to c, so that means we can cancel out this a and c too, and that will immediately lead to b is equal to d. But if b is equal to d, then we know we have the following equality between our ordered pairs. We know that a b is equal to c d, as we have independently shown that a is equal to c and b is equal to d. Great. So now let's go ahead and get into some scratch work for our surjectivity proof. So I'll just go ahead and write out that we are doing scratch work here. So let's go ahead and suppose that our function evaluated at a, b is equal to, let's call this m and n, as they are elements of our codomain and they are defined as such in the problem statement. So let's just say that f of a is b is equal to m n. Well, right away from definition of our function, that means that a is equal to m, but it also means that a plus b minus one is equal to n. But we know that a is equal to m, so then that, that means we can solve for b here. So that means that b will be equal to, well, we'll move the one to the other side and subtract the m, and we'll get that b is equal to n minus m plus one. And so we'll go ahead and use that for our proof. So let's go ahead and start that proof. So let's begin by supposing that we have an ordered pair. Let's use m and n again. So m and n, which is in our codomain, which is defined in the following way. It's all ordered pairs, m and n, which are in n cross n, such that m is less than or equal to n. Great. Let's go ahead and unpack this less than or equal to uh, definition here and then see if we can use it. So if m is less than or equal to n, we can write that in a different way as n minus m is greater than or equal to zero. And we can do that just by subtracting that m over in that inequality. But now we can add one to both sides. And we'll see that that means that n minus m plus one is greater than or equal to one. But if it's greater than or equal to one and m and n are both natural numbers, then that means that n minus m plus one must be in the natural numbers, which is an important condition that we have to verify here for surjectivity. Now from here we can use the fact that we established in our scratch work to show that we can always map to n and n. And I'm not actually going to write that out again, but we can just go ahead and write observe that if we evaluate our function at m and n minus m plus one, we will get the ordered pair m and n. Great. So that finishes this proof of surjectivity off, and thus we have proved that our function is bijective, which means that we have proved that the cardinality of these two sets is the same. And that's a good place to stop.